Thanks so much for sharing your garden with us. And right now we're going to learn about the useful wild plants of Texas and how there's a hidden treasure chest of genetic material here in our own backyards that we're hardly aware of that feeds the world right now. Uh, joining me are Scooter Cheatham and Lynn Marshall, who are the creators of this amazing project, the Useful Wild Plants of Texas. Welcome back to Central Texas Gardener. It's been a very long time. and It's great mm -hmm. to have you here. Thank you, Tom. It's good to be back. Yeah. Well, and we talk about a massive project that you've been doing, and I want to give people an idea of the scale of this. You, you have been working on a set of books that are comprehensive uh, look at the, 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 the plants of Texas that, are, uh, that have great utility for mankind, whether mm -hmm. they be textile plants or edible plants or what have you. We're going to be focusing on edibles today. And you're creating this series of books. Now, you're creating these all on your own. You're publishing them. They're beautiful volumes. Uh, and you, you are probably going to have 15 in the total. 15, we think. Mm -hmm. 15 in the total volume. Right. The first three are out. So we're, you're taking the plants in, in uh, alphabetical order. With, by genus. By, by, the, by the genus name, <clears throat> right. right? By the scientific name. And it's just a really phenomenal undertaking. So uh, the first three volumes are out, and people can avail themselves of this. Now, you, you, you also engage the public in your work, don't you? We do, um, <clears throat> in a variety of ways, uh, mm -hmm. through memberships and also through classes. Weed Feed class is pretty well known, and it's how I got involved in the project mm -hmm. back in the late 70s. I took Scooter's class. And mm -hmm was so interested in this and it fits so well with my background in anthropology and archaeology that I just mm -hmm. I just stuck with it and, and it, I am planning to see it through to the end <laughs> <laughs> the, the other 12 volumes that, well, but the classes are a way people can can learn a lot more about this and go out and, and directly experience right. the plants in their and native right. habitats and find find out how to use the plants right because we do a slide lecture and then field trips and some camping right. trips and a banquet so people yeah. people get a lot of exposure yeah. in a in a safe mm -hmm. way and a lot mm -hmm. of fun well speaking of safety there's a safety you know, I've talked about treasure chests and there's mm -hmm. a, there's a security in the tr that treasure chest that we have because uh, we can lose some of these uh, incredibly valuable uh, cr crops in That's disastrous true. disease events. There are two security in the past. Yeah. There are two security issues. Since since you touched on this, one is this is one of these things is don't do this at home without proper identification because <laughs> the class is great fun. Yeah. But uh, it, it we've seen people that have taken the class and you know in the beginning can to watch them very carefully because you can make a mistake and pick sure. the wrong thing. They get yeah. chlorophyll fever. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. But, uh, the, but the other security issue is a little more serious for the world. A little more serious <laughs> for the world. Uh, and, and one of the things that we could talk about, I guess, t today uh, that might be a familiar topic to people is that um, many of the uh, many of the items that they, they find at HEB or Central Market or whatever, whatever grocery store they shop, in the produce department, we have genetic wild stock for many of the, over half of the things they see. And uh, um, people may remember hearing about the potato famine or the lo loss of the grape industry or the near loss of the grape industry in, in uh, France. And uh, without wild genes that are adapted to their native habitat, um, there's a chance of losing any, any of the big crops that we have now. Right. So. So well, what happened, let's take the, for example, the, the, what happened in France, which was uh, they had they had a, a hugely planted out uh, wine industry. Right. A disease came through and pretty much destroyed it. Right. They didn't. They had no way of dealing with it, and that can happen to us too. We like to think that it couldn't, but it can happen today. Well, <clears throat> most of our domestic crops are extremely vulnerable, mm -hmm. uh, whereas the nat native stock is is adapted. Right. Uh, where it is, it's adapted to the soil, it's adapted to the uh, uh, pathogens. Right. And so it's tougher in generally. And, 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 but often the wild stock has, it's too small, it's, the seeds are too big, mm -hmm. it's too fibrous, it, the taste isn't quite right. And so over time, uh, as horticulturists do their work, sometimes mm -hmm. over millennia, yeah. uh, we get blander, less fibrous, sweeter, mm -hmm. larger, juicier, uh, but as we do that, 
then we have to we have to tend more. We have mm. to take care of those those crops. And so, so in the wild form, uh, if you look at a <clears throat> you know wild context, it looks like the brushy stuff that we see around here. But but the germ of all those uh, uh, crops that we so cherish now. Mm -hmm. uh, Often, kind of lie hidden in that in that scene. So. All right. Well, speaking of the crops that we cherish, right next to Scooter, there uh, a beautiful assortment of chilies, and uh, very typical for what I would see in the grocery market every Saturday. Oh, that's right. Um, there's a collection over there. All of those were developed from the native chili patin over mm. thousands of years by anonymous selectors and breeders uh, in North America. So that. To me, is a good example of if we put as much attention to what we have all around us that we tend to ignore, mm -hmm. we would unlock all sorts of things we can't even begin to imagine. But we're right. not doing it because we we think we have everything we need. But as we've pointed out, things are a little more vulnerable than we might believe. Well, there's, there's a vulnerability, but there's also potential out there as well. Great for, potential. Uh, and we're going to talk about some species that have market potential that right. to me sound really appealing of, as a food crop. But uh, let's let's dwell on the chilies for a moment here as an example though. The, the little native chili, the, the bird right. chili that grows wild in our gardens often or between right. cracks in the sidewalks really is the parent plant for all these things. What, what else is out there in the wild and under a foot? Before we forget it, mm -hmm. volume three has just come out. Okay. That's treated in volume three. Okay. Capsicum is in volume three. Okay. Um, we, went th we went through several things. Uh, an example would be uh, for pe tomato lovers, we have mm. the original wild tomato in deep south Texas. And uh, an the example- The original wild tomato. The original wild tomato. Mm -hmm. And there's a long story about Talk about tomatoes. an heirloom. <laughs> Talk about an heirloom. And they're delicious. I gotta tell you, they're, they really have a better flavor than the, mm -hmm. uh, all of our other selections. Mm -hmm. That really tart. Yeah, I love uh, that. Juicy quality. Um, the, for people who might remember the potato famine, we have uh, several species of wild potatoes in West Texas. And mm -hmm. in Davis Mountains particularly, there's, there are two species there. Um, the tomatillos that you you get in salsa verde, mm -hmm. you know, if you buy tomatillos and make sure. your own. Uh, uh, we have a number of species of, of wild tomatillo, mm -hmm. Phasalis, and uh, many of the wild forms are smaller, but they're really good. I, I think they're better. Yeah. I think they're better than the... Well, the there, we have wild forms of a lot of fruits, like grape, uh, plum. Right. Uh, there are right. uh, things like strawberry, of course, that right. are... We have two species of, of uh, right. wild strawberry in Texas, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Progeria virginiana, which is what our is what our commercial strawberry is bred for, mm -hmm. from, is you can find that uh, wild in East Texas. Yeah, uh, and talk about get, delicious, so those uh, little tiny fresh strawberries, and amazing you, flavor. You said your experiences mm -hmm. are boring. Yeah. Uh, um, I want to talk about some of the things that are potential. Well, we don't have a lot of time, okay. uh, but uh, there are certain, uh, w these are all things that we're familiar with, the chilies, the plums, the strawberries, that sort of thing. But there's some uh, plants out there in our backyard that uh, have a lot of potential that, to come to uh, our tables, but haven't quite yet. And yeah. let's talk about some of those. There's one uh, that I'm very curious about. It's a, a little tree from the southeast primarily. It's called pawpaw. Right. Uh, and tell me a little bit about that plant. Well, we have two species of pawpaw in Texas, and the fruits taste about the same. They're about the same size. One is big. It's a tree. It's a semina triloba. I think that's in volume one. Uh, and the semina parviflora, which is a small one. It's sort of knee-high. And generally, varmints get it because it's so good. It's mm -hmm. so lush. Uh, they both produce uh, ripe fruits in mm -hmm. early fall, and they go from a green sort of like a huge peanut mm -hmm. uh, to to yellowish, and mm -hmm. then they have developed little black spots on them. That's when you need to check them. But they're they're just uh, some people. One of the common names is custard apple mm -hmm. because they're so good. Now there's a pawpaw trackers club <laughs> developed in the east and southeast and and there's one of the big growers i think is in california too they trade around selections of the of the pawpaw mm -hmm. to to get bigger you know tastier fruits uh, so. and that custard apple makes it sound as Pretty darn yummy to me. It's really good. <laughs> now, there are a couple of other ones I want to talk about. Um, 
There's something called peach bush as well that is a, a fairly common to uh, this area, right? No, no, it's rare in this area. Uh -huh. It's common, the, the sort of center uh, of the native habitat for peach bush, which is botanically called Prunus texana, uh, is in Falfurius. Okay. It likes sand, mm -hmm. uh, but there are, there are some of the uh, some of them ventured up mm -hmm. and, uh, as far north, north as here, but if you really want to find them, you'd have to be in the Falfurius area. But, okay. but they make wonderful jelly and jam, and uh, they're very good. Well, there, there are lots of potential out there, as well as uh, some of the, the most important genetic material on the planet in, for, in terms of our, the table that we eat from uh, every single yes. day, all throughout Texas. And you're compiling all the information about these plants, their utility, and in, in these beautiful volumes. Real briefly, I want to give people uh, again an opportunity to learn about how to be in touch with you and how to uh, uh, to get the books themselves. These are available uh, online, I'm sure, right? Mm -hmm. What would you do? Mm -hmm. Through through our website, mm -hmm. uh, usefulwildplants.org, or they can call the office and the phone mm -hmm. numbers on the on the website. Right. They can. Call us up. Okay, and they can learn about the classes that mm -hmm. way and participate. And you're actually calling on people to come and be engaged with the work right now. So that's a, that's a good thing for volunteers out there who are interested in this very exciting topic. It is indeed. All right, well, Scooter and Lynn, thank you so much for being a part of Central Texas Gardener, and good luck on the, the remaining volumes of the Useful Wild Plants of Texas. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, coming up next is our fantastic.